Bonjour tout le monde. Bon après-midi. Hello everybody. Good afternoon. Nice to see you back after lunch. I'm Jennifer Petrella for the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. Thank you for this first afternoon of the 11th annual Trudeau Foundation Conference. So, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all back to a very exciting panel, one I've been looking forward to for a number of months. Uh, I won't uh, describe the panel to you, you have the panel description in your program description, but I will say that this panel is going to be moderated by a Trudeau mentor, Marie-Lucie Morin, who has an extensive background in international affairs. Madame Morin a été conseillère à la Sécurité nationale auprès du Premier ministre du Canada et secrétaire associée au cabinet. Elle a aussi été sous-ministre du Commerce international et sous-ministre déléguée des Affaires étrangères. Son dernier poste a été celui d'administratrice pour le Canada, l'Irlande et les Caraïbes au sein de la Banque mondiale. Bon panel. Merci Jennifer et bon après-midi à tous et à toutes. This is the perfect after lunch panel, I promise you. We shall be lively, interesting and provocative, right? Excellent. So when I was asked to moderate this uh, panel, I was uh, quite uh, taken actually with the uh, metaphor, which I thought was quite evocative, of uh, turning the tanker. And uh, for anybody in this room, and I know that there are many, who have been asked to manage an exercise of figuratively turning a tanker, would know that it uh, only requires uh, strong analytics, great strategy, the right set of policies, a perfect implementation plan, concerted action, and above all, great perseverance. That's all. So uh, our panelists today, whom I will introduce in a moment, will discuss how sustainability can be achieved while dealing with often diverging interests within the developed world and uh, taking into account the very legitimate development ambitions of the developing world. We will talk about the impact of trade, globalization, investment, because capital flows are very important in our issue, the links between, for example, climate change and food security. We haven't talked too much about agriculture yet. We will talk about the possible impact of the sustainable development goals, which uh, will be uh, negotiated in their final stance next year, and explore changes that could put the world on a path to sustainability. So our format is very much the same as uh, you have witnessed earlier in this forum. It is going to be a conversation. The panelists agree with me that each question that I will ask them would merit a 30-minute answer, correct? But they have agreed to really limit their answers to about three to five minutes. So we do have three or four questions for each of our panelists, and we will be leaving ample time uh, at the end for a uh, question and answer period. So you have the full biographies of our panelists with you, so I will give them only a short presentation. Stuart Elgy is Professor of Law and Economics at the University of uh, Ottawa. He is Director of the Environment Institute and founder of the Sustainable Prosperity, a green economy think tank and policy research network. Welcome, Stuart. Then we are welcoming Fiona Jones, who is General Manager of Sustainability at Suncor Energy. Prior to joining Suncor, Fiona worked at Petro-Canada and held many positions in a number of financial institutions. And Claudia Ringler, who is Deputy Director of Environment and Production Technology at the International Food Policy Research Institute, with which I was very familiar in Washington. Claudia is a water systems expert and has studied extensively the relationship between food production, water management, and synergies of climate change mitigation and adaptation. 
So, as we begin our conversation, we know that globalization and trade have been a game changer in many ways. It has contributed to reducing poverty, it has created jobs and growth. Of course, the context of globalization has not only brought about entirely positive outcomes, uh, we have seen less than felicitous outcomes, including, of course, in the environment field and emissions. So, um, I will turn to Claudia first and say, we now can, in London, buy beans from Kenya. Uh, here, we can buy fruit from all over Latin America and so on and so forth. It would be very interesting for us if you could share your perspective on what role trade and globalization has played or is playing in making the agricultural uh, sector more sustainable in the world today. Thank you very much. Um, okay, is it better? It's, it's, I'm not controlling it. Yeah, first, thanks uh, to Trudeau Foundation for inviting us. I think it's always extremely exciting for me and engaging talk to people who don't just focus on food, which is what I'm doing otherwise. So on the question of uh, trade, yes, uh, trade uh, today, about 20% of all agricultural commodities that are produced in the world, they leave their national boundaries and move into another country. So trade has increased uh, very gradually from about 10% uh, of the commodities that were traded maybe about two decades ago and 20% now and it's going to very slowly increase in the future. And why is that? It's simply because we have very rapid population and economic growth. And a lot of countries that currently do not have the agriculture systems and will also not in the future have the agriculture systems to produce all the food that they need on their own soil. And those countries include the Middle East and North Africa where that have been extremely net food import dependent for decades. And we do see you know, continued population growth for sure and also economic growth there. We see the fastest population and economic growth, for sure population growth and also significant um, economic growth in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that region has also been a large and growing uh, net food importer, particularly of staples uh, such as rice, uh, wheat, and, and to some degree also maize. There are other countries, such as China, um, that have for a long time had very strict food self-sufficiency policies, but they've also realized that their national land and water resources are simply not sufficient. It doesn't make sense for them to try to produce all the food themselves. So they have gradually reduced their food self-sufficiency, and we see more uh, food moving into that country as well. So is trade good for sustainability or not? All in all, we see more food uh, being exported from countries that have more ample water and land resources and being imported into those countries that do not have those resources. So that is generally good for sustainability because we don't want Egypt or Pakistan to, to drain their last small wetlands that they have when we have a lot of water, for example, in Canada. That is, you know, that reducing or using that water for food production doesn't um, affect uh, national biodiversity levels as much or global biodiversity levels. However, we have a few other countries um, with small remaining, sometimes large, but more often small remaining important tropical forests such as DRC Congo and also Indonesia or Brazil. And so those countries would have ample resources to become large uh, net food exporters or they already are as Latin America is. So, but there, if, you know, we just cut down the remaining tropical forest because we say, oh, you know, those, these countries could be extremely large exporters, then we, then we would obviously lose not only a lot of biodiversity, but we would also uh, release, uh, generate a lot of um, emissions and reduce carbon stocks. Just a quick example from DRC Congo because the speaker yesterday in his notes mentioned that, oh, if the St. Lawrence Riverway would not be navigable anymore because the water levels uh, go down, that would increase uh, deforestation in DRC Congo. Alternatively, if civil conflict and, and war stops in DRC Congo, they will also cut the forest down. And I don't know which one will happen first, we'll see. Um, but, but basically, if we cut down one hectare of tropical forest in DRC Congo because we say, oh, it's a good food producing area, 
the, the global warming potential is equivalent to producing extremely extensively agricultural production on that same hectare for 529 years. And there are similar calculations for other uh, tropical forest areas. So we have to be very careful. So it's not just, oh, I have more water, more land, so I should be exporting. We have to look at all indicators. Similarly, you know, the biofuels policy forgot a couple indicators, such as water and land. They said, oh, okay, it's good for emission reductions, which it also necessarily, not necessarily is. It's good for energy security. So it's important to, um, for us to say trade is sustainable. It's not a, a very clear-cut situation, but certainly for those countries and, and there's a growing number of countries um, where we have growing numbers of population, they will need uh, stable trading systems because of growing climate variability, growing price, uh, food price vol volatility. So it's very important to keep those trading systems open and stable. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Turning to Stuart, um, as developing countries grow their economies, and they will continue uh, to do so, so do, of course, their carbon footprint. So the question for you is, how would these countries very practically begin to grow an economy in a way that does not increase carbon emission or even... Simple question, huh? Yes. How do you change the arc of modern industrial development? Um, I think this whole session is going to be full of um, three-minute answers to, to day-long uh, three, three minute answers to day long questions. So uh, I will throw out a few things that will inevitably leave lots of big questions and I invite you to pepper us with them later. I'm not a development expert, by the way, so I don't pretend to have any great expertise on how this happens in developing countries. I do most of my work in the developed world. But I actually think when you boil it down, the answer is not that different. Uh, where you want to end up, and I think to do this stuff, you should, it helps to reverse engineer it from where you want to end up at, because there's many different pathways to get there. Basically, we want to um, reduce our energy use as much as possible. We want to meet our needs in a way that's as energy efficient as possible. And we want to generate that energy in a way that decarbonizes it as much as possible. You can really boil it down to that being most of the result, right? Use as little energy as you can and try to source that energy from sources that have as little carbon as possible. Getting to that is a big challenge, but that's where you want to get to. Uh, so what, how do you do that? Well, you produce clean power, right? You have to find ways of generating it. The big gap on the production side is how do you store variable power? So when you've got wind and solar, we've talked about this before, there's a challenge of making them cost competitive. Solar is almost cost competitive. In some parts of the world, it is cost competitive right now with coal. Um, but the, the, the question is always, the sun doesn't always shine, right? The wind doesn't always blow. So how do you create cost effective, um, technologically available sources for storing what is a variable power source? We're making progress on that, but that's one of the areas where we actually need technological progress. Um, the other part is transportation. So the energy production, transportation is the other big user of fuels. That's mostly cars, cars and trucks to some extent. And so we've got to find a way of powering our transportation that doesn't involve fossil fuel combustion. Easy to say. Um, we have electric car technologies right now. They're getting closer to being cost competitive. Uh, breakthroughs on batteries will make a big difference. Um, lighter bodies on cars. There's probably a lot of, it, it, most of the thinking is we're probably several decades away from the place at which electric vehicles start to become uh, a really significant part of the transportation fleet. We don't know that, um, but that's sort of the best guess of people to think about this stuff. In the meantime, the big gap is going to be making the vehicles we use as efficient as possible because the vehicle growth is happening in the developing world. There is going to be a massive growth in vehicles in the developing world. We could try to curb that, but you know, we're not in a great place to tell them they shouldn't do that because we do it. So making those vehicles as fuel efficient as possible and trying as quickly as we can to make um, electric vehicles uh, cost effective are the kind of transitions we need to get to. Um, one thing just to add in, it's a completely different way of thinking about it, but Fiona talked about agriculture. Always keep in mind that 20% of the greenhouse gas equation is forests and land-based sinks. So 80% of it is fossil fuels, but 20% of it is what we do with the lands, particularly the forests. And so if you go to countries like Indonesia, Brazil, Congo, most heavily forested developing countries, their biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions is deforestation and forest loss. Uh, it's not, it, it, electricity generation is growing, transportation is growing, but deforestation and forest conversion is still the biggie. And so finding ways to maintain forests is critical. How am I doing on time? 
okay, half a minute. So uh, the arc of human history in half a minute. The big issue is how you do that, right? Um, the key is what's called decoupling. And I'm not talking about Chris Martin and Gwyneth Paltrow, for those of you who follow Coldplay. I'm talking about decoupling economic growth from environmental impacts. Actually, you know, economic growth, um, I think, is a bit of a, a straw dog in this. The real issue is how do we drive down carbon emissions as well as other critical problems like water use, biodiversity loss. And so if, if I had a slide up here, I'd have a slide with GDP going like that and environmental impact starting to move that way, um, where you basically decouple. And if you stay for the afternoon session later, we'll get into a lot more of the details about how well we can do that and how we do it. But the point is there's lots of examples of it, right? Ontario, Canada's reduced sulfur, the critical air pollution emissions by more than 50% in 20 years. Our economy is still growing. Ontario's reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 20% in seven years. And you know, the economy, while not robust, is still growing. So it is possible to decouple. In the developing world, a big issue is leapfrogging. And maybe I'll hold on, talk about leapfrogging a little bit later on and uh, let others jump in. So, uh, Stuart, you've mentioned that uh, global energy consumption accounts for 84% uh, of emissions, essentially fossil. That underscores a magnitude of the challenge for meeting rising demand uh, in energy uh, in a sustainable way, of course. Uh, and certainly, I can tell you, when I was at the World Bank, um, just about the first discussion when we would meet leaders from the developing world was that power was key. Power was key to development, right? So the challenge is at once na national. It's very much global as well. And the energy systems are more and more interconnected through trade uh, and investment. So turning to you, Fiona, where does a company like uh, Suncor fit uh, in this picture? How do you look at the world? And how would you articulate the challenges of turning the tanker? Thank you. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to add that I'm uh, very honored to be here and thank the Trudeau Foundation for inviting me. Um, I, too, uh, looked at the metaphor of turning the tanker and thought, you know, a, a great metaphor for the, for the magnitude of, of the venture. Um, but at another level, I thought, well, you know, a tanker is a single unit. It has one captain. It's got a crew that are very practiced at processes to turn it. And it's got some pretty good navigation charts in terms of not running aground. Um, and then I started to think about the energy system. And... Unlike a tanker where you're sort of pushed along by a single engine, the energy system is really pulled along by demand. And if you look at that demand globally, um, it's very different uh, the world over. Different uh, communities are at different stages of economic development. Um, they have you know, different aspirations for their lifestyles, for their economies. And uh, you, they also have different resource endowments to, uh, to fuel that energy. Um, the other thing is that we're looking at a global population of 7 billion going to 9 billion, with some people forecasting potentially going to 11 billion by 2100. So that, you know, that very much plays into that demand side of the equation. The energy supply to, to meet that demand has really grown very organically uh, around local or regional resource endowment and uh, you know, when you look at the energy policy that's developed, energy policy is extremely political. Um, it's a, you know, there's a um, mix of, of public and private business models for producing and for delivering energy all over the world. Um, even as we start to see energy policy being developed around climate change, it's still very easy to see how quickly issues like uh, jurisdictional energy independence and security come into play or uh, local economic priorities come into play. So um, you, when you add to that that sort of complicated relationship that energy has with food and water, you start seeing a bit, a bit of a different picture. What I started to envisage in my mind was not so much turning a tanker, but turning a pile of marbles on a plane of glass. So. Um, Thinking about that, you know, how, how do you do that? And it seems to me that you can only really do it by creating some gravity. You, you know, you, can, uh, you, you can't push them along. You can't, uh, uh, you know, 
it, it, it's not quite the same as, as, or as simple as turning the tanker. Part of creating that gravity is really getting to grips with what the opportunities are and what the pathways are. And uh, the imperative of the two degree scenario has certainly driven some very um, well thought through and very serious pieces of work that look at energy as a system and try and envisage uh, what, uh, what the big levers are that we can pull and uh, what the inter interdependencies are. And, you know, as we look at, uh, at, at some of these studies, it's very clear that we have uh, a big leap of technology to make. Um, and that's going to be, you know, the, the challenge and the opportunity. I think, you know, as we see how this will unfold, um, it seems to be defaulting in the direction of let's first get the power generation system uh, to a low carbon power system, uh, low carbon system. Um, it's the big lever to, to pull first. Uh, coal is one of the most uh, carbon intensive forms of fossil fuel. And natural gas, particularly with the recent shale boom, really provides uh, a technically feasible and an affordable way to make that switch. Um, and likewise, renewables are very real today. Um, certainly wind and, and solar power are technically feasible and the cost has come down quite dramatically. So there's a, a need to restructure the, the generation system, restructure the, the transmission system away from a sort of grid and spoke system to a, a, something that can manage a distributed model, manage intermittent uh, power with storage, and also um, a, a need to change the business model for delivery of power because you know, the existing business model doesn't really work in that distributed approach of being more of a broker between, between entities. Um, a lot of parallel uh, opportunities taking place or, or priorities being addressed in the interim and Stuart mentioned energy efficiency, uh, vehicle efficiency, biofuels and some of the alternative transportation fuels that are you know, getting to be technically feasible but still quite costly. Carbon capture is another big option that's, that's on the table. And then there's that softer side of the transition, things like um, rising urbanization and planning for uh, uh, lower carbon mobility. Once you have a robust and resilient um, power generation system, then the opportunity uh, is there to start moving other sectors, and particularly transportation, over in a much more significant way to electrification. Um, probably most relevant in, in urban areas for light duty fleets and, and less so for uh, non-urban and, and heavier fleets. Um, so in terms of, of uh, the oil sands um, role in, in, uh, in this outlook and in this scenario, we certainly see oil um, starting to decrease in terms of its proportion of the energy system, but because of rising population, we don't see uh, global demand destruction. It's very clear that the energy system transformation is an innovation uh, challenge, and the story of the oil sands is a technology and innovation story. It's what has defined and created the oil sands industry, and it's what pushes us along right now, because you know clearly we are um, the, the methods that we use to produce oil sands are more carbon intensive than the methods that uh, conventional oil uses. And so we have uh, a very, very strong aligned interest in terms of cost of energy input and re emission reduction to create a step change in the way that we produce our, our bitumen. So for instance, in in situ, if we can get rid of steam, we can get rid of uh, energy emissions and we can get rid of water use. So that really is the holy grail and that's uh, where the oil sands industry is putting you know, fairly unprecedented effort on technology and innovation that although it's you know, fully intended to reduce our own carbon footprint, it's important to understand that our facilities are exactly the same as most large industrial gas powered facilities the world over that provide power or provide manufactured goods. Potential breakthroughs that we make in technology could be applicable in many, many different situations. Likewise, um, some of our R&D and things like bio-diluents and uh, 
storage, battery storage. So, you know, that really would be how we see our role. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to now talk specifically about investments, and the chair has been lenient so far with timing, but moving forward, might not be so lenient. So, Claudia, we've seen some large investments going towards the ag sector globally. You might want to comment on the uh, impact of that in food security, but I thought it would be perhaps particularly interesting to hear you on investment in R&D that might make crops more resilient in terms of, of uh, climate change. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think um, what the chair first mentioned is those large investments in land. Um, basically, they have come about as a result of the 2007-2008 food price spikes or food price crisis. What happened back then, it was a series of events started with the uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005 and the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 in the United States that diverted uh, half or more of um, U.S. maize production into biofuels. Together with some climate variability challenges, you know, food prices started to rise, followed by very bad um, national policy responses in terms of trade restrictions. Countries stopped exporting rice. Other countries got very worried about that because they very much needed, uh, were relying on food imports. Anyway, so food prices kept uh, increasing, spiking, specu speculation uh, also contributed to that. And in the aftermath of all of that, we have seen a flurry of policy responses, again, some good, some bad, many more subsidies and fertilizer and other things that we really thought we were moving away from, but also a much larger interest from investment sectors that we had never thought of before would be interested in directly investing in land. And also a lot of countries that are not food secure themselves, such as uh, Saudi Arabia, China, some that feel they're not food, food secure, like uh, South Korea, uh, also India, Japan, Kuwait, etc. they all started to invest in land resources in other countries. And those other countries, I think, you know, include to some extent Canada, but the, the key Investments have been made in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, parts of former Soviet Union, and Latin America. The challenge has been that the governance structures, the land tenure structures in many of these countries are very weak, and a lot of the eager government officials were you know, willing to make large concessions to those countries or uh, investors, a lot also from the, the same countries, from the national countries. And a lot of those deals were made without consulting the people who are actually working that land, um, yeah, without considering what will happen to the people that were on the land, etc. And so, before we talk about egg research, so, so from those land deals, you know, a lot of them have fallen apart, um, especially the most agrarious ones, like even away half of the arable land of Madagascar and so forth. So, so that hasn't quite worked out as planned. But um, so, so, you know, those land deals sound very bad, but they're not all bad. So those farmers, you know, that were connected to markets that have secure land titles, uh, that could benefit from rural infrastructure that generally was promised as part of those land deals and in some cases actually materialized, um, those that could benefit from that, um, you know, have prospered. Uh, so some new jobs have been created. But all the other people who didn't have secure land titles, um, who were still not connected to any new infrastructure and didn't benefit from technology transfer for various reasons, uh, obviously have lost out. Um, and, and overall, yeah, the land investments, I think much of the promise that, that was there hasn't materialized. So that's on the land investment side, and it has all gone a little bit more quiet, you know, because food prices have come down a little bit. But, but unfortunately, what we're going to see is much more variable food, um, food prices and so, you know, a lot of the, I think a lot of the quieter deals are still going on and have actually expanded, but a little bit under the radar <laughs> of, of the NGO and, and other communities. So we, I think it's very important to keep monitoring what's going on. And there are a lot of, uh, there are international monitoring efforts and obviously also guidelines for more sustainable investments uh, in land. On the research side, obviously that's also investment. So, you know, Food prices have been declining in real terms for more or less two decades until the food price spike. And, and now I think the majority um, of agencies that look into, into uh, food protections 
believe that prices, at least for some of the key staples, will continue to, to increase uh, as part of the economic population, food demand shifts, and also, of course, climate change. There's a some that believe prices will go down. And that's also, so basically there's not a full consensus, but overall we believe that they will keep going up. So agriculture research in direct seed technologies and also some management practices has been essential to, to reduce those food prices in the past. There, has been, there had been a lot of complacency in investments because the food prices had been going down, so no one was interested to invest in that anymore. Plus, we have the urbanization, so it became more interesting, much more interesting, including uh, by the World Bank, to invest in non-agriculture sectors. Uh, everyone admitted to having neglected agriculture. That has changed as a result of the food price crisis. Investments in ag research, uh, including to look into drought tolerance, uh, Submergence tolerance uh, during floods, heat tolerance, um, so a lot of um, uh, abiotic stress tolerance uh, research is going on. Um, so some new varieties are coming out. Investments in public ag research has increased from about 26 billion US dollars in 2000 to about 32 billion US dollars. But there's no reason for complacency. Much of the increase was just uh, you know, five, six countries uh, led by China by far the largest investor and you know has a very clear policy what they want to see, what they want to see get done and they're actually getting things done in agricultural research there has been some improvement in india brazil nigeria iran russia and i think that's about it and the rest of the world so all the poor countries that really need the ag research the most are still not investing and they also show the most volatile uh, investment behavior and compared to you know, 20 years ago, while investment has gone up, it has become, for everyone, just more volatile. So I'm part of the CGIR, so we're a consultative group in international agriculture research. We are supposed to, to support those countries that have the weakest investment systems and to focus on those crops where the private sector doesn't sufficiently focus on. And so our, yeah, our investments have also increased as a result of the food price crisis, but have also become more volatile more conditional um, has been, I mean, you know, so while generally there have been improvements, I wouldn't say that we are now on a stable path for, for uh, increased food security. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. We can hear the passion that is being transmitted on the part of our panelists. Uh, Stuart, um, on the topic of investment always, uh, what overall level of investment is Canada making in renewables? Are we being successful today in integrating renewables into our energy system? And, of course, the question for you is what policies could catalyze a shift to cleaner technology? And, of interest, which jurisdictions would you say are the far farthest ahead? Um, okay, well, let me work through those one at a time if I can. Um, so, what do we have, renewable energy? Everyone defines it differently. Uh, so Clean Energy Canada probably has about as good a handle on this as anyone. So if you look at um, wind, solar, small-scale hydro, biogas, geothermal, um, they're, they're about to put in a really great report in a week, by the way. So you'll, you'll have all this information a week from now. Um, they say it's doubled in the last five years, and it's up to about 10% of our power system right now. So gone from about 5 to 10, growing at about 20% per year. So still a small part but growing much faster. And that's kind of the global story too, right? Renewable energy is a small part of the overall mix, but it's growing much faster than the other parts of it. Uh, and so both of those are, are true in their realities. Um, what are we, and, and the provinces, which provinces are doing best? Uh, Alberta, BC, and Ontario are up to about 13 to 15% of that package of renewables. Now obviously if you consider large scale hydro, then BC, Quebec, and Manitoba, that get almost all their power from hydro, um, come out at the top of the list. So it depends how you define it. The question I think that's most interesting is the last one you asked, which is how do we move towards rapidly ramping up that level of renewable energy, uh, particularly in the places that still rely heavily on fossil fuels? So that would be Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, Nova Scotia, to some extent Ontario through imports. Um, and to me, there's there's... I guess three big barriers that you have to overcome to get greater penetration of renewables. The biggest one is cost. It has to become cost competitive with, with alternatives. Um, the second is storage technology for the, the variable power sources. And the third is having a grid system 
that lends itself to incorporating these new types of power into it. Uh, the cost one, you can deal with both through a push and a pull on the market. So if you start to price the externality costs of coal power, and even gas power to some extent, um, all of a sudden if you just sent a bill for the greenhouse gas and the health costs of emitting coal power, wind and solar would be way cheaper. So even if you just paid the true cost, the costs that we pay through our healthcare systems uh, and through uh, the various costs of climate change, if that bill was sent to a coal power producer, they would shift immediately and you would shift as consumers and change your behavior. Um, so pricing carbon is critical. Um, in the, until we have that, pushing the market through some sort of feed-in tariff or renewable portfolio standards is really important as a way of getting a nudge. Just like we had to nudge the oil sands to get it started, uh, renewable energy is going to need a nudge like most startup sectors in order to get it started. Um, the storage we've talked about, in some ways that's a technology challenge. Uh, we've got technologies now, they need to become more cost effective. We've got some really good companies in Canada that actually are becoming leaders in energy storage, like NR Store, for example, and others that Tom Rand can tell you about. And then grid, again, I think that's a big, big issue, right? We have got an entire energy system built up around centralized, large-scale production distributed through a broad grid. And where I am at, University of Ottawa, about eight years ago, Alan Rock agreed that we wanted to put a whole bunch of solar panels up, and Ottawa Hydro said we can't. Your grid linkage will not allow that new input of variable power. So even though we dealt with all the other concerns, we got stuck because we were at a part on the grid that couldn't take more variable. Now, that started to change. We saw our first bracket panels went up about the last year, but that's a real issue. Uh, when we come to developing countries, talk a little bit about how that plays in. Um, but well, I'll, I'll just shut up because you've got lots of other people. <laughs> you know, now, a bit of a complimentary question for you. So, Suncor has increased its investments in, in renewables. So, if you could share with us a little bit, what is the way forward for a company like yours? What are the considerations that inform your decisions? And of course, now we have, for example, a very low price of oil. Does this have an impact? And then um, I would like you to have a chance to also address the issue that came up this morning of disinvestment uh, in fossil fuel in certain quarters and, and ask you uh, whether you find this, uh, you know, how, how do you see this as a means of it? And I've got five minutes. <laughs> um, I'll start first with renewables. Um, Suncor went into biofuel and wind uh, probably 10, 10, 12 years ago. Um, it was really what we then called a parallel path uh, strategy of investing oil sands wealth into uh, a new and emerging market. Um, that strategy, I think, is as valid today as it was then. The, Renewables market has uh, advanced a lot, but there are still a lot of issues where we can bring expertise to. Um, the whole question of, of how we make our decisions and, and uh, would we increase our uh, renewables investment is, is a tough one. Um, we tend to, we, we engage a lot with what typically called socially responsible investors, and we very much understand their perspective and understand their desire to see us play a much more active role in the renewables market. Um, we also uh, disclose our, uh, in the carbon disclosure project, um, and, and that reporting uh, tends to, to have a very big emphasis on, you know, what role you're playing in, in terms of uh, alternative and renewable energy. But there is a bit of an issue in that uh, when we talk to other investors, it seems like we're living in two solitudes, and renewables are not necessarily a slam dunk for all investors. I, I would say that, you know, we define our corporate strategy based on shareholder value, and then we go out and we explain it to investors, rather than, you know, them driving or, or pulling the levers. Um, so, you know, we, most of our investors understand that there is a business case for us to be building options in renewable energy. Um, they understand that some of these options need to have a, a return on investment that's potentially lower than some of our other projects. Although I will say right now, we are looking at some alternative financing vehicles for some of our wind energy, where you know, we're really uh, getting some serious questions from investors. 
there's a very clear message from many of our investors that were we to start taking large and risky bets with their money on renewable energy, uh, some of them would actually head for the door faster than, than we'd like to think. Um, they make it very clear why they invest in us, yield and liquidity. Uh, a lot of them really prefer pure plays. And, um, you know, we, uh, uh, we need to balance those two realities. So, you know, would we invest in renewables at scale at any point? We would if the economies were there at scale. We um, do a lot of, well, we did a, a scenario uh, analysis recently, and following on that um, uh, outlook that I talked about just now, about the sort of um, electrification being the basis of the, the power grid of the future, or the energy system of the future. We looked at that and said, well, you know, we are the fourth largest independent power producer in Alberta. We never think about ourselves as being a power company. But we export a lot of cogeneration power to the Alberta grid, replacing coal, and we have wind power. And so, you know, we started to think about that. What, it, what would it mean to slowly transition over time? Um, those are very big strategic decisions, and I don't know necessarily that they're going to be driven by this, you know, divestment um, issue. Um, yeah, we, you know, last week uh, we hosted uh, a, a day-long conference with Royal Bank Pembina on stranded assets. Uh, I missed the discussion, unfortunately, but I believe it, you know, it was a pretty interesting day. And, you know, I think that the conclusion that people came to is if you really want to um, make a difference, you need to tackle demand. Um, the di divestment campaign and the, and the notion of, of, you know, scaring capital away from uh, the energy markets uh, is, a, is a pretty complicated one. You know, there are scenarios where if you start moving capital away from, uh, you know, specific industries or specific parts of the sector, um, you and you take supply out of the equation, or you take reserves out of the equation, but you don't change the demand side, what you land up doing is you land up forcing the price of oil up and handing a windfall over to national state-owned oil companies or to, uh, you know, the other, those other companies that are still hanging in. So it, it really just is not as, uh, as linear as, uh, as it can sound like it, like it might be. I wanted to jump in with one thing more of a question. So, uh, I know Suncor, like a lot of the major energy companies uh, in the country, puts a shadow price on carbon in a lot of your internal investment decisions. And I, I, you don't have to disclose it, but it's probably somewhere in the thirty to forty dollars a ton range. I don't know if it's public, but okay. So she's in. so. How much doesn't that start to make wind more cost competitive as a power source for your operations? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, shouldn't that change the economic, but there's a mismatch between your internal shadow price and what your investors see in terms of their real return on investment. Is that, is that the gap? Um, it, it depends on the jurisdiction. Okay. You, you know, um, some jurisdictions are, uh, have, a, have a better return than others. There's no question in Alberta that a um, higher carbon price. Sorry, it's right there. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Is there an issue with? Can everybody hear us? No. All right. You, you, you missed the whole last exchange. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. Are we? Everybody. Okay. Any other opinions? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I told you this would be fun. Okay. I think we, we might come back to some of these issues and the discussion periods, so I, I'm, I'm quite keen. We have two questions to, to go through still. The next one is about the role of the sustainable development goals. As many of you will know, uh, the MDGs are about to sunset, and this past July, the Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals has finalized its proposal for a set of 17 goals, 
with a very expansive and ambitious uh, set of targets, which uh, are meant to cover the broad range of sustainable development issues. One of these goals uh, relates directly to climate change and another one to energy, and you see uh, bits and pieces relating to both in the other goals. So uh, my question for our panelists is, uh, how can, do you expect that the SDGs can be impactful in the context of our discussion? Do you have a view on that? And what would be the role of the private sector, for example, in, in supporting and perhaps arriving to shaping the final outcome on these goals because it hasn't yet been uh, finalized. So I don't know who wants to uh, go first on this. Yes, sure. please. Yeah. Thanks, and I, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, so obviously the SDGs are very important for developing countries, but what developing countries like is that they're also important for developed countries. As you know, the MDGs only set targets and monitoring processes, etc., for developing countries focusing on human development. The SDGs have sustainability in them, and there's a very clear understanding that we can only achieve sustainability if everyone uh, changes behavior, everyone becomes proactive. So those, those goals relate to developed and developing countries. So that's the first uh, big, um, I think, big benefit over the MDGs. Um, second, you know, despite that, you know, despite also developed countries finally being asked to do something and to monitor some of their natural resource developments and inequities, et cetera, um, despite that, the, the big bang for the, for the bug in terms, in terms of, say, trying to change behavior and development is, of course, laying with the developing countries where all of the population and economic growth is going to take place. So, so, but then the third benefit is that we now, you know, we, we have all this, I mean, we, we heard it's, what, 17 goals and it's 169 targets right now. There's a lot of competition and trade-offs across these targets and goals. So we want, you know, food security for everyone, no more poverty, no more inequity. Uh, we want no more land degradation. We want sustainable water resources. And obviously there's trade-offs, but what, what those SDGs will help us to do is hopefully develop frameworks to assess those trade-offs and then to, to determine which ways different countries want to go forward with. And lastly, you know, those developing countries that keep saying, yes, we would like to, to protect our environment, but you know, development has to come first and, and we want first more food security in the country, more self-sufficiency, at least now they're, they're, they're at least asked to monitor and look at their natural resources as well, develop institutions. To, to focus on those issues, and then they can say, oh yeah, we now also have to look into those issues. It's not just make sure that um, you know, everyone has access to sanitation or water resources. So, so I think all in all, it's a good development. Um, in the end, it will depend on national political wills to, to take them on and to move them forward, because they're generally not mandatory. But I do think that they're a, a positive step forward, and certainly an advancement over the MDGs. Fiona, do you want to comment? <laughs> um, you know, I would say for us, the, um, you know, it, it is a key issue, and I think that few people in developed countries take the time to reflect on how much they owe their improved uh, circumstances to a reliable energy system. In terms of the UN SDG goals, um, Suncor as a, as a relatively small player and, and really focused uh, in one area is not, uh, doesn't have a very active presence in that arena at all. Um, we are members of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and we have participated in an initiative that has, looks and feels like it's got a lot of similarity, which is their Vision 2050 process and their Action 2020, um, you know, pathways to, to uh, to get to Vision 2050. They've identified a series of agreed must-haves and uh, it's really a, a springboard for dialogue and a springboard for um, companies thinking about how, how they can contribute. And where we've been active is um, around uh, you know, harnessing our technology and innovation strategy as a solution provider and particularly a uh, water technology commercialization center that we have at one of our facilities and um, some uh, exploring some uh, natural infrastructure options. When we think though uh, about that, um, that construct, we tend to think closer to home um, and think about 
you know, shared value opportunities that we have in the community that, that we operate in, which is the Wood Buffalo area of, uh, of Alberta. And uh, that's really where, you know, sharing value it, it comes back to for us. Um, sharing value isn't really about distributing the wealth that we create more. It's about actually expanding that whole economic pool of, of uh, social value, used increasing our competitiveness at the same time as dealing with, uh, with social or economic issues in the region. So it's really a sort of businesses acting as, as businesses. And um, we have been very heavily invested in that uh, community. We've really shifted our community investment strategy um, towards cultivating community leaders and building capacity in, in the nonprofit sector, building skills and knowledge, inspiring innovation, uh, engaging citizens. And another one that's been very interesting for us, which is collaborating on our energy future. And I talked a little bit about creating that gravity um, uh, earlier on to, to sort of shift the system. And there's a lot of technology engineering solutions that go into that, but there's also a real human construct to energy that I think really needs to be understood. That, you know, energy is, is um, how we think about energy is, is reflected, you know, as our history, it's reflected in our aspirations, it's reflected in our values. And so when you're looking at changing that system, you really need to work at um, a sort of grassroots level, you need to work at a policy level, but you also need to work at changing the whole value system and, the, and the, that landscape. And there's some very interesting organizations out there that are doing that, um, that we've been working through our foundation with that are really trying to uh, address energy as a, as a human construct. And um, then a, a number of others that are, you know, looking at more grassroots initiatives. So, Stuart? Sure, I'm, I'm the furthest thing there is from an expert on the sustainable development goals, so I will hold my half ill-informed opinions to myself on them. You can ask me later if you really want to know. But what I do know a little bit about is, is how you drive economies in this direction. Um, and I think, this is really just finishing up my answer to question one that I didn't want to finish. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to promote developing countries to engage in a sort of a technological leapfrog, right? You know the classic story about how they went right to cell phones instead of having to go through the whole distributed copper wire network. And ideally, you want to do the same thing in terms of clean energy production and transportation. If they have to go through what's called the Kuznets curve, right? How many of you guys know Kuznets? All the environment, enviro geeks know it. So the idea is, is that you gotta, you got to get really dirty before you can get clean. As your economy grows and grows and grows, eventually you'll care about cleaning it up and you'll clean it up. We don't have the luxury of every developing country in the world going through that same arc that we've gone through. We've got to fast forward and leap right to the clean end of that curve without going through the dirty end. And doing that, so there are advantages and disadvantages developing countries have in doing that. Their disadvantage is they're poor. So they don't have the luxury we have of saying, we will choose to pay a little bit more to achieve those outcomes. Um, they couldn't shut down all their coal power plants if it cost them a lot more money. The advantage they have is they haven't already locked in with 100 years of institutional history into an existing system. So they actually have a chance to get it right the first time instead of having to, to uh, take apart a whole bunch of institutional momentum. So for example, carbon taxes. A lot of these countries are just putting in place their environmental and fiscal regimes for the first time or modernizing them. So Chile just brought in a carbon tax. South Africa is about to bring in a pretty ambitious carbon tax of about $12 a ton. Uh, Mexico has a carbon tax. China now has a price on carbon through much of its economy through three, three major city uh, cap and trade systems. So we're seeing carbon pricing coming in, in some ways, more quickly in the developing world than certainly in North America right now. Um, infrastructure. Uh, why would you put in place that whole bulky, massive, distributed grid, centralized model of energy generation if you could, you know, it may be that solar power can do that same kind of technology leap that cell phones did, right? If you could have distributed solar panels with battery technology that would store it, that would feed your power, power your cars. Um, so the challenge is just getting the technology to them at a cost that makes it cost competitive because they cannot afford to pay extra for this. So technology transfer and investment are going to be really critical to their ability to do this stuff and do it soon. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> well, now we get to the question that the panelists have been looking forward to answering, <laughs> which is, 
what is, in your view, what could be or would be the most significant change that could put the world on a more sustainable path? And after that, we'll have the Q&A. So who wants to start? <laughs> I, actually, it's the one I was least looking forward to, but that's okay. And I think the re I mean, partly it's because I know so many things that will not lead the world to a sustainable path, and <laughs> there's because there's so many fads and silver bullets out there. So I'm a little bit tired of hearing them. I'm certainly hearing a lot more since the food price crisis and the agriculture sector. But I mean, what I believe is the way forward is really you know to keep to keep the uh, environment, environmental conditions and uh, agricultural production conditions and the trading system stable and open. Uh, we need very strong governance of natural resources, you know, and, and it's not just carbon, really, it's water, land, energy, carbon. We, we really have to keep all of them in mind at the same time because, as I said, otherwise we have things like biofuels, um, biofuel development. It's very important to phase out these harmful subsidies um, for energy, fertilizer, you name it, water. So these really are, you know, that have moved us in, in, into this very uh, negative pathway, uh, negative sustainability pathway. But it's also the other thing that matters. So one is governance of, uh, strong governance of natural resources. The other one is sustained investments in innovations. Um, in, you know, in part, the crisis helped us to, to come up with new innovations. Uh, climate mitigation policy, climate policy has led to new innovations. Again, not all good, some good. So, but we have to just ensure, you know, that we don't constantly invest and disinvest in innovation. So we just need to maintain a very strong basis of investment in innovations. Those countries that have invested in agricultural research and development, just because that's my area, uh, have much faster uh, total factor productivity growth. Uh, for example, China, you know, leading, obviously North America, very much, very strong there as well, Brazil as well. So it's a very clear one-to-one, -one, uh, also in terms of uh, better resource use efficiency. You know, those countries that have made those investments in new technologies, nutrient use efficiency, et cetera, there's a lot out there, still has to be developed. So those countries uh, will be doing better uh, and will be more resilient, you know, given uh, global changes that some of which we don't know yet will come upon us. Yeah. Yes. I'll uh, jump Anna. in now because I suspect I'm about to steal some of Stuart's thunder. <laughs> but um, our CEO, Steve Williams, um, is one of the advisory board members of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission. And uh, they re recently released uh, the first in a series of reports on pricing externalities like carbon on a, an economy-wide basis as being you know, the most efficient way to, to turn the dial. And um, we have been part of that process because we do think that this is uh, a conversation that needs to be had here in Canada. And uh, I'm going to give Suncor a lot of credit for doing that. It is a gutsy thing for the CEO of a major oil company in the current political climate in Canada to stand up and say we need a price on carbon. So whatever you think of Suncor's practices, they deserve credit for that. <laughs> They're speaking the truth. So um, I love questions like this because I like thinking about complex systems and where your critical points of intervention are in them. Um, not because I'm right, because I think it's just fun to think about. So I guess I'll start by answering this in a personal way. If, if you had asked me this question 20 years ago, I would have given you a very different answer. I was, uh, as Zippor and others know, I was a, a young lawyer, started up what's now called EcoJustice, Canada's main environmental litigation organization, left a Bay Street law firm, and spent about a decade uh, deciding the most important thing we need to do is just to sue the bad guys and beat them up so they change their behavior. And we did a lot of that with a fair amount of success. Uh, but I got to meet a lot more of the, these corporate bad guys uh, as I got on in my career, and I realized that uh, they weren't such bad people after all for the most part. I, I've yet to meet one of them who woke up in the morning thinking, God, I'd love to mess the planet up today. If I did, maybe they're there, I just didn't meet them. Um, but they woke up thinking, how do I make a profit? Right? How do I make a return for my shareholders and employ my employees? And most of them, if they could find a way to do that while still lowering their environmental footprint, would have been thrilled. The problem was they operated a market economy that doesn't reward lowering your environmental footprint. Uh, because we don't put a price on environmental harm. And we are the same way. We all live unsustainably, at least those of us in the first world. Not because we want to, but because the market prices, that are the main, the main mediating force between us and our impact, don't tell us the truth. They lie to us. Um, if you think about it from an, an energy and carbon perspective, 
Um, the things that drive climate change, right? Why do we use coal power instead of cleaner alternatives? Why do we drive gas-powered cars instead of electric ones? Well, the main answer is, is it costs less. Um, if you change, and it doesn't really cost less, obviously, right? If you actually said, as I said before, the real bill for those costs, societally it costs more. It's just the classic flaw in a market economy. Even Milton Friedman, Ronald Reagan's right-wing guru of trickle-down economics, used to tell his students at University of Chicago, my free market theories don't work when it comes to the environment. It's the ultimate example of a market failure. Um, so if we're going to live in a market, if you unpack climate change and most environmental problems, in the middle of them you find an economic problem, I think. Um, and if we're going to live in a market economy, I don't see any way that we become sustainable without having market prices start to tell the environmental truth. And that also can help drive the innovation and investment that you talked about, Fiona, because how you're going to finance that level of clean innovation investment um, with countries that have a whole bunch of other needs is tricky, and the revenues from environmental pricing and carbon pricing are a really good source. And Alberta is doing that to a small degree with its carbon price right now. But I just want to say one thing, because I think... What I just said is not new. Economists have been saying that in much less publicly communicable ways, sadly, for decades. Most, you'd be surprised how many of our political leaders, corporate leaders, and deputy ministers already know that in private rooms, and they'll tell you that. So to me, the real question is, why aren't we doing it? Um, why aren't we doing the thing that most of our leaders know is the single most important thing we need to do to solve what may be the single most important challenge of our time? And to me, this is the political economy question that we should really be spending our time on. How do we actually create the political conditions that allow our leaders to do the things that most of us know we have to do? And it's tough, right? I mean, you can see examples every day of why it's tough. Uh, you just have to look at the papers in Nova Scotia the last two days, right, after the Broughton Commission on Tax Reform recommended a carbon tax in Nova Scotia. And they're getting hammered from the right, job-killing carbon tax. They're getting hammered from the left, uh, energy poverty and they're caught in the middle with nobody defending them. Uh, and so this is a real problem if you're a political leader. How do you get the political license to do the thing we know we have to do? It's a big question, it be worth discussing it, but one thing I'll say just to plant a seed of thought is this, that we've had lots of examples, or a number of examples in Canadian society before, of where we've realized we have to make a major economic or societal transition. And government has actually played a leadership role in helping to pull the population there. You think about deficit fighting in the 90s, uh, moving to a free trade world, uh, socialized health care. Those are all things where they seem difficult, but we managed to kind of mobilize a shift. And we have that same kind of shift in sort of moving to a green economy. And the, the thing I think is probably the biggest thing we need to do is to abandon the way we think about the economy. We think that economic progress has to come at an environmental cost and environmental progress has to come at an economic cost. We have to pick one or the other, and this job-killing carbon tax plays into that narrative, that environmental protection is going to hurt the economy. Sometimes we should do it anyway, but it's going to hurt the economy, and as long as we have that narrative, as long as we have that economic myth as a country, we are always going to fall behind environmentally, but we're also going to fall behind in what's likely to be the major next big global economic shift to a cleaner, low-carbon, more resource-efficient economy. In many ways, we're still living with a 20th century economic model, or maybe 19th century even, moving into a 21st century economic world. And so how we actually begin to think of greening growth, or whatever you want to call it, low carbon growth, clean growth, as an economic opportunity, rather than a threat or a harmful medicine that we should take anyway, I think is going to be critical to our ability to create the political space to do the thing, frankly, that economically most of us know we have to do already. I don't know the answer, but I'd welcome discussions on it. Thank you. So we have been, in the end, very disciplined. And uh, I will now welcome questions to our panelists. I would ask you please to identify yourselves and, if possible, uh, designate one of the panelists from whom you would uh, elicit an answer or two. Uh, and please bear in mind that we actually, I cannot see you. <laughs> we, we have the lights in place. So please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony Marcel, and I would, I'm going to ask a very short question, and I would like a short answer from each one of you, including the moderator. Some, some years ago, Finance Minister Martin, when he announced the Sustainable Development Indicators Project, ended that announcement right here in Toronto by saying, that the SDIs would be as important to the budget formation process as GDP was. 
And a room full of bankers drew their breaths and there was dead silence. Stuart, <laughs> does anybody think that Canada will be more successful with the sustainable development goals than they were with the sustainable development indicators? So I have to say I'm not aware of the SDI uh, project. So the SDGs are global. Um, yeah, you know, well, it's driven, it's a UN process, but yeah. they're voluntary, so people will have to sign up. Um, as I said before, the big benefit we expect will not be from developed countries, uh, because there are many other processes already, and we do, there's a lot of monitoring going on. The benefit will be um, in, the develop, in the developing countries. And some of the current targets, I think, will not be easily accepted by, by a lot of developed countries, actually. So I think there will be a lot of pushback before the final set uh, is developed. That will be probably much simpler than the 169 targets we have right now. So yeah, I, I, for Canada specifically, I don't expect uh, any large uh, changes compared to what we see today. I'm going to say that I don't have enough depth on that to, to really provide a, an answer. Um. So two things. One is, I think, uh, it's an example of the perfect being the enemy of the good. We've spent so much time in the quagmire fighting over what the right sustainable development indicators are that we end up with things like the UN Sustainable Development Goals with 164 of them. And if you have 164 targets, you have none. Um, but I think goals themselves are important, but what really matters is your commitment and your institutionalization towards actually achieving them. Uh, and so there are countries around the world that have actually set sustainable development goals and really looked about how they ripple those down through the internal operating machinery of their governments and push them out into the, their society, Sweden being a good example. Uh, California, to a large extent, on low carbon is doing it pretty well, too. Um, we've done it on things like deficit fighting. We talked about it for a while, but then there was a time when government said, okay, we're going to set this goal, and they really set their mind to it, and it became uh, an internal discipline that drove the entire government. So if we set the goal, great, but we then have to attach the accountability and the systems and the discipline that means we're serious about meeting those goals. And I think that all comes back to beginning to see it as an economic opportunity because that's what's getting in the way of moving on this stuff. Right. I'm supposed to be a neutral party. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that, um, of course, it will very much depend on the final shape of the SDGs and that is not yet ascertained. It will also very much depend on what goes on in other fora related to what we're talking about uh, here today. Uh, the SDGs are very much multilateral in nature. Uh, so, you know, you, you get carried by a wave uh, in these exercises. The only thing that I would like to say is that with respect to the MDGs that are coming to an end now, Canada has been a very, very uh, positive and active uh, contributor to the, uh, to the MDGs. So let's see what happens with the finalization of, of these goals and then maybe we can sort of, you know, get back to it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharon and uh, climate change has become my issue bar none. And I'm so grateful to this whole weekend. It's just fantastic. Um, I'm with Citizens Climate Lobby and they're calling for carbon fee and dividend. And so I'm really glad you're talking about carbon pricing because that is key. And it can be approached with calling it a fee and, and using the words revenue neutral. And also with that, you know, Citizens Climate Lobby have the job reports, they've, they've taken them from different places, that show we can have way more jobs on a green economy than a fossil fuel economy. So putting that information out there, uh, even if you said it's, it's a job creating carbon tax, but don't use the word carbon tax. Use the word job creating carbon fee and dividend where the dividends get returned to the uh, public. So I guess my question, I don't really have a question, but what else I mean, is that thank you to Suncor, first of all, for, for um, speaking up about this. But can you do it more? Because it has to come. And then the, these politicians, um, people can push them. People, this weekend, I'm actually leaving tomorrow for Citizens Climate Lobby Conference in Ottawa and lobbying on the Hill on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and 70 volunteers are going in and paying their way. So, uh, yeah, 
people letting their politicians know at the federal and at the uh, provincial level that that's what we want, carbon fee, and I guess uh, Suncor, can you speak up louder? <laughs> that's all I can say. Back in the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Megan uh, Daniels, 2012 scholar. Uh, my question concerns uh, renewable energy, which uh, Stuart touched on a little bit, and I had the pleasure of talking with Fiona over lunch a little bit about this. Um, and my ideas for this question came from this week's uh, bottom line panel uh, on the CBC. And of course, the bottom line question was, is Canada on the road to prosperity? And of course, um, you know, our fear of stranded assets with the uh, oil sands came up, and this idea of having, you know, the, heading towards this kind of fossil fuel free future um, with solar and wind power, and I just wanted to know if we could kind of unpack more, what do we mean by renewable energy? It's obviously not that black and white. What are the hidden costs to this kind of renewable energy, particularly considering with, you know, the, the issues with the SDGs, um, with the capacities of developing countries to develop this kind of, these kind of energy? So what are the hidden social and, and environmental costs? of what we define as renewable energies. Um, and also, once again, considering the, the first question on the food biodiversity, are we headed more, less towards a fossil, completely fossil fuel free future and more towards you know, a bio or a diverse energy future where different parts of the world, according to social capacities, economic capacities, uh, geography even, will be having, you know, it's more about diversifying energy resources rather than strictly heading towards a fossil fuel free com uh, future. Thank you. Yeah, you're looking at me, all right. Um, uh, I don't know that much about the hidden costs of renewables. I'm not an expert on you know, electromagnetic fields and that stuff. I do know that certainly large-scale hydro, in the 90s, we used to, everyone was against it. Um, that was before we had climate change as an issue. So there are environmental costs to every type of uh, energy generation. Um, and uh, I think the Greenhouse gases are certainly the one that seems the most important and imminent and destructive of all of them right now. So there is no cost-free way of getting energy. But I think pushing away from fossil fuel-based sources is just going to end up leaving us in a better place. The one thing I guess I would add to your last point about an energy mix, though, is that the reality of it in Canada is that we're likely to live in a world in which there will be um, oil and gas you know, for two or three decades at least. Uh, it'll be declining, probably. It may be longer than that. I don't have a crystal ball. And so I think we actually have an important question as a country about um, what do we do with our oil and gas assets in, in that time? Uh, and I think there's a couple of things we should think about. One of them is, uh, and it goes to what Fiona said, um, if, if you're a Canadian oil producer, um, you're thinking about how do I continue to sell my product in an increasingly environmentally concerned, carbon constrained world. And I think it's interesting to see the oil industry in a more serious way than they ever have before, thinking about how do they drive clean innovation in their sector? How do they reduce the GHG footprint and the water footprint of producing each barrel of oil? Because as the CEO of Shell said uh, a few weeks ago in a meeting, if we, if we are the environmentally marginal barrel in a world of in, in declining oil supplies, we're going to be left out in the cold. Now, this isn't to say that they're there yet, but it's interesting to see them beginning to put more energy into that through things like COSIA than has ever happened before. And in some ways, it's the same kind of awareness we saw with the forest industry happening in the, in the 1990s and 2000s. But the other part is we should really think about how do we use the public wealth that we will generate from royalties and, and carbon fees from that oil and gas over the next few decades to help fund the transition to a cleaner, more efficient energy future. Because uh, funding that is going to be really important. And so to the extent that we are going to have these industries and we can at least push them to be cleaner, um, we should also think about using the wealth that really invests in getting us to a more prosperous, efficient, cleaner future. Uh, because that is going to be the real part of the transition. No one thinks we're just going to flip a switch and become a fossil fuel free country tomorrow, um, even if some people might wish it. So let's think about how we make that transition in a way that accelerates getting to the future and makes oil and gas part of that transitional strategy. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nathan Andrews. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta and a 2012 Trudeau Scholar. Uh, my question has to do with sustainable development goals. Um, I, it's great that, um, Claudia, you did say that most of the people who would benefit most um, from these goals are people in the developing world. Um, there's no denying that fact. But I think while we know that, and that's pretty much the logic that surrounds most of these goals, um, we realize that some of these 
people in those areas are not involved in the development and design of these goals. My question is, um, I don't know the extent to your involvement or maybe the other panelists can weigh in as well. Do you think that um, for the new goals that are coming, um, these people that are supposed um, beneficiaries of these goals have been involved to some extent? I mean, I don't expect the over one billion people to be involved, but as to how much of an involvement you think has been, has been in, um, has been incorporated into the development of these goals because I feel that um, we, we would come around again after 10 years and still have a round table and talk about this and have a different set of 180 goals if these people are not involved and they don't really know um, okay. what you know people are talking about from the north so it becomes okay. it becomes a top-down approach and I think we need to move away from that to be able to okay. influence that kind of change that we really want um, in the developing world. Okay. So Claudia, do you want to talk a little bit about the process? Yeah, and maybe you can also weigh yeah. in. I mean, very shortly from my side, I haven't been directly involved. I've been asked to comment from a scientific perspective if the goals are achievable, especially the food security goal. Um, I have attended one such meeting in, in New York on this topic as well. So, so it has been a, a probably two-year-long process at least. There have been a lot of consultations in the various regions and countries. There has been a lot of on there's online, there's online consultations, you, you can send all your comments in. I've been told, but I haven't seen the evidence, that food security was the, the key goal raised by developing countries and, and the key goal raised overall. Um, so that was actually seen as the most uh, important goal that people would like to see being seriously pursued. Um, and, and also, just to say, so now this, and as you said, now the process is obviously in a much, in a much uh, smaller group of hands, and, and the final product probably will look somewhat different from the more consultative component, and that often happens, and some, obviously, to some extent has to happen, because there has to be some consensus. But then again, you know, how those goals and targets get adopted in the countries is again up to them. And again, if you have more democratically elected governments in those countries, you expect that there is more consultation and more input from, from the people in those countries that ultimately uh, benefit or don't benefit from that. And in less democratically countries, probably there will be less. But, but there will certainly then, how those goals and, and targets get ad adopted or not, um, institutionalized, monitored. So that will again depend on the political will in the countries. Thank you. All I would like to add is that it is a UN process. It is very consultative and, uh, and uh, frankly, uh, I, I think that there has been uh, ample opportunity for all countries, all parties, civil society to contribute uh, to this. Um, the difficulty with the goals, as was the case with the MDGs, and I think we will see the same going forward, is always an implementation. So I'm just complementing what Claudia is saying. So uh, I think the process itself has been uh, very, very uh, inclusive from what I could uh, see from, from, uh, from the outside. Please. Hi. Um, I'm Graham Carey. I'm a PhD student at University of Toronto. Um, and I'm curious what Stuart and Fiona think um, would be the economic and business impacts of a government policy that leveled the playing field by requiring all energy producers in Canada to um, contribute of their, of their spending a certain percent towards one of the three um, areas that Stuart mentioned, uh, either carbon neutral energy, uh, storage, or transmission? Um, I'll answer that question um, from the perspective of the existing regulation in Alberta uh, on climate change, which has been in place for five or six years now. Um, one of the compliance options under that regulation is to contribute to a uh, technology fund, climate change emissions management fund. And so, um, you know, close to 400 million has been contributed to that fund uh, over the years, and it's leveraged up um, because of, of matching contributions. And um, we're very supportive of that construct because that money is not uh, tied money. It doesn't. It's not uh, a loan. It's not uh, an equity investment or coming with you know, various different strings. If you can, uh, if you put in an application that's strong enough, you'll get that money. And so, what it does is it really provides that long-term patient capital um, to uh, to energy innovation. 
Um, you know, whether you, you make it a sort of a, a formalized construct or not, I, I think that an enormous amount is happening, uh, certainly from the oil sands. We're invested in um, clean tech, uh, uh, venture um, kinds of organizations. We're funding a lot of academic institutions. We're in crowdsourcing uh, types of approaches. So looking at that whole innovation funnel, right from you know the sort of real uh, top end of the funnel down to commercialization, one of the things that we're trying to get underway right now in Alberta is a natural gas commercialization uh, testing center for, for emission reduction. Um, one of the comments that's always made about Canada is that we have great ideas and we have uh, great sort of startup processes, but we just lose momentum when it comes to commercialization. And that's something that we think is, is, is really critical. So, um, big role, yeah. Would you like to add something, Stuart? Yeah, just so, um, so briefly, so in a way, that's what a carbon tax would do. This is Alberta, Alberta has is a version of a carbon tax, even though they would never use those words. Um, the problem is, the amount in Alberta is way too low. So you're talking you know, maybe 100 million or less a year for investment. If you had, so just give you a number. So if you had a $30 fee on all carbon emissions across Canada, so a BC style carbon tax, you'd bring in 20 billion a year. Um, and the question you ask is the one I actually worry about the most. I think that if we're gonna achieve the changes we need at the pace we need them, we're gonna need a major public investment in infrastructure, in terms of grid systems, public transit, uh, building efficiency, and we're going to have to recognize that the private markets alone are not going to drive investment in this direction as quickly as it needs to. That's just the history of this stuff. They will be part of it, but the myth that private investment alone will do it is just wrong. So you're going to need to have a role for public investment to both nudge and accelerate innovation, particularly at the primary stage, but also at this later stage adoption and commercialization. So if you accept that, and you may think I'm wrong, um, then the question is, where do you get those funds in a really fiscally constrained time in this country with an aging population, record personal debt loads, and many of our provinces in serious deficits? You've got a need for a massive public investment right now if we want to begin to put in place the technology and infrastructure that 20 years from now will support a low-carbon economy. We can't wait till them to do it, but at a time when we're really fiscally constrained. And this is where I think carbon pricing is critical. It's the best source I can think of for actually providing a new source of revenue that will help drive some of that clean investment in technology and infrastructure. So I have gotten the yellow card. So <laughs> I think we still have five questions. What I would uh, like to do, privilege of the chair, is take all five questions in a row now. So I will ask the panelists to get their pen at the ready and then we will turn to the panelists to answer them in turn, if that's okay. So please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Riley Lackanen and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto as well. Um, my question is actually probably more directed to um, Fiona and it's in part um, to ask a bit more of a difficult question because I don't know that you've been asked really hard questions just yet. And um, in, our, in our breakout session this morning, uh, Sephora Berman encouraged us to, um, as polite Canadians, exercise our right to, you know, call out companies and ask, ask these tough questions. So my question has to do with, on the one hand, you, you really spoke about um, the need to um, change and shape demand by creating gravity to shift the system, this marble analogy that you used. Um, but on the other hand, you talked about the fear of scaring away investors from uh, risky investments. Um, it seems to me that someone else brought up the idea of divestment campaigns. Um, in some respects, that, that shows uh, a desire on the behalf of, of um, more public investors to to want to in, you know invest in these more renewable energy sources. So, at what point then does it become the uh, possibly the responsibility of companies like Suncor to to start to notice these other kinds of trends in investment um, from younger generations coming up um, and to say, okay, we are going to try to shift the gravity um, through our own investments because I know that um, oil companies are really good at packaging what they want to sell. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the Trudeau Foundation and offering this free conference. And thank you for the speakers. Professor LG, you ignited something in my mind. And you know that uh, the sign on the screen there, it just reminded me of the future 
flying cars. <laughs> and I heard, and there will be already uh, a test drive of this pilot car next year. I think it's spring, you know, by, by the U.S. So when you mention about electric cars and the sustain of the systems and institutions, I, I we're ready because I'm thinking of you know the crashes up in the air. <laughs> okay, next question. Thank you. Uh, Lloyd Helfrey again um, from the. Uh, Canadian Biochar Initiative. Uh, I have a quick question for Fiona, and you don't have to answer except for, for yes or no. Um, are you aware of the uh, biochar carbon protocol for Alberta? Um, is one question, and actually the big question I had was actually for uh, Claudia, um, and who had mentioned things like investments into seed technologies. Uh, and the question is, what about investments into, uh, because Seed technologies remind me of Monsanto, uh, these big corporations that control okay. the seeds. So I, I'm thinking, what would be your your take on investments into agroecology, um, organic permaculture, uh, smallholder, uh, even urban uh, food production systems at local levels, um, in helping actually to meet the the both the ecological as well as the food security goals? Because I know. I think it's the uh, UN World Food Program has said that uh, agroecology will form a very important part, and maybe even a critical part uh, of our food security future. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take two more. So, yes, sir. Thank you. For the record, I want to confirm that I don't know him, but my question is going to be a little bit similar. <laughs> it's for Claudia. My name is Pat Mooney of the Etcetera Group. And Claudia, my question is about uh, the, your sense of the capacity of private sector agricultural research globally to be either a hindrance or a help to, to our food security in the year 2050 with climate change. The specific concern I have is that 45% of all uh, private sector agricultural research today is on one crop, corn. That if you look at the, the leading six companies in the world, they control 76% of all private sector agricultural research. Those same six companies control two thirds of global seed sales and three quarters of global pesticide sales. So if those six companies look at their investment in innovation to get around climate change, frankly, their investment is much higher if they invest in public relations than it is if they invest in private research. They are themselves fundamentally an oligopoly. This morning someone was asking about joy and need for more joy in our lives. Well, this is the joy of six. Six companies that really do dominate our, our private sector food system. How can we survive climate change with that kind of domination of the food system? Thank you. Thank you. And last question. Hi, my name is Pamela Pastin. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a registered nurse of Ontario, and I'm volunteer with the Angels of Mana Inc. And one of our projects are a soup uh, kitchen for the low-income people. As well, we distribute fresh bread. We take it from the bakery. And the last one is the shoe boxes, which we send it to Onion Lake at Saskatchewan. These are for the Aboriginal children. My main concern is we have to raise $1,000 just to pay the truck to transport those toys, those shoe boxes, to Onion Lake, Saskatchewan. And I ask myself, uh, here we are talking about free trade with other countries, and what happened now to these Aboriginal children who are malnourished, they don't have enough energy supply, no water, isn't it charity begins at home? Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I, the last question, I guess, was uh, directed more towards uh, provision of uh, infrastructure and energy and, and so on and so forth, perhaps to the more remote uh, areas of the country. I wonder if you would have something to say about that, uh, Stuart, and, and maybe somebody raised the issue of driveless cars. I don't know if people in the room know that I've been... Uh, working on a transportation project. I would say there's certainly regulatory aspects about uh, those kinds of vehicles, but uh, 
I mean, maybe they will be electric or I don't know. Anyway, why don't you take a crack at it? Uh, you want the just need to sort of spend a minute or two just sort of commenting on what we thought we can say worthwhile to those five? Yeah, well, you may, yes, uh, as long as it's uh, short in time because I'm going to get the red card. I got you. No, okay, okay, great. Sorry, let me go. So, yeah. um, uh, so you, the first question was about uh, the divestment one. It was to Fiona, but I just want to say one thing because I was at this stranded assets panel last week too as one of the, the speakers at it. Um, I never discourage folks, particularly young folks, from making an effort to do good for the world. I think the push towards divestment is a good thing and it's worth it. I actually don't think it's going to be where we're going to have our major impact, but it's okay. No one thing is going to solve our problems. I think if you think of what will accelerate our transition away from fossil fuels, it will be more changing demand than choking off supply. Most of the world's oil is produced by state-owned uh, oil companies who are going to produce it uh, we're not going to make a political decision to stop producing it. You're not going to get them to divest. So we should still work on it, but actually making alternatives to fossil fuel combustion cost-effective and available, in other words, drying up demand for the product, is the quickest way uh, to probably get to where you want to get to. And, and things like accelerating battery technology and BC's carbon tax has brought down fuel use by 16% in five years, while their GDP has outperformed the rest of Canada. So those kind of things can have a real impact. Uh, flying cars, I will leave to the Jetsons, but as long as they're not fossil fuel powered, probably not a bad thing. And the last question is one that I worry about as a Canadian a ton. Uh, I think that we talk a lot about international development as universities we teach it, but we have a huge international development question right up in our north of our country with living conditions and social and environmental problems every bit as real as we find in many of the poorest parts of the world. I can't pretend to answer the question now. It's a, it deserves its own conference one year on how we solve it, uh, but uh, I'd like to attend that conference. Thank you. Fiona. Um, yeah, just, you know, with regard to the, to the question on investors, I, I think it's really up to us to, to drive our own strategy where we see the business opportunities and then sell that strategy to, to shareholders. And they'll very quickly tell us um, whether they like it or not. And um, we do need to remember that shareholders are volunteers in this process and the sell button is, you know, very, very close at hand. And so, you know, when we look at um, where our biggest risks lie, we focus on demand all the time because that, that really is what's going to, 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 to change the picture and, and, and change that gravity. Um, so, you know, in terms of seeing opportunities, other opportunities, Believe me, we will move that way very quickly and very capably um, when we see that, that, that pull and that demand. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There. Yeah. Claudia, mm -hmm. well, 2050. 2050. Um, <laughs> no, so, yeah, first, also very, a quick note on Canada. Yeah, I mean, you know, just the fact that Canada is a very rich country is not able to, to provide sufficient safety nets uh, for for the poor parts of its society just tells us what all the poor countries can do. I mean, if Canada can handle it, imagine, imagine all the other countries in the world that certainly don't seem to be able to handle it. But certainly for, for Canada, it's, a, it's just completely out of the question what they're doing in this area or what they're not doing. I mean, it has to change um, and, and drastically so. And for that, maybe the SDGs will be helpful. Um, in terms of uh, agroecology, various agriculture management practices and seed technologies, so that, you heard me before saying there is no silver bullet, there's not one single technology, and the same really applies for agriculture technologies. So we have uh, brought out a big, uh, a new study earlier this year that looked at 11 um, agriculture technologies, and just for the main stable crops, maize, rice, and wheat, and we're keeping told all those might not be the most nutritious ones. However, they still account for about 42% of uh, calories consumed globally, and they will still account for about 40 to 38% you know, out into the future. So they are really important. They're important for everyone. And so you know, what we found is that there, again, is not one technology, there's not one seed technology, there's not one management practice that works everywhere, that does increase yields everywhere, that reduces uh, environmental footprints everywhere. So we really need a mix. And the co for, as an ag agriculturalist, I constantly face the question, is it GM or is it organic agriculture? And, and sorry, it's not one or the other. Fortunately, it's a mix, or fortunately, actually, it's a mix. Um, it's very important to, to diversify into all the technologies that do increase yields and that do reduce environmental footprints. Um, and because organic does come up, so for the three, um, for the three main uh, grains, 
we did find conclusively, even so some people will say no, it's not conclusive, we, f we feel it's conclusive that uh, organic agriculture, if done correctly, as they say, which means no uh, external fertilizer, etc., et no pesticides, uh, apart from maybe uh, some, some natural pests, it actually does reduce yields. It doesn't increase yields. And I know there are some diverging opinions out there, but that is the, the scientific finding. Um, agroecological approaches certainly are part of it. You know, they are part of also modern or industrial agriculture. So it's really, again, not of one or the other. Um, I don't think the World Food Program would focus on agroecological approaches because their focus is food aid. So they're actually trying to buy or uh, locally procure, uh, especially maize, but, but also some of the other crops. But there are other UN agencies that, that uh, talk a bit more about agroecological approaches. In terms of this uh, private sector concentration um, of, uh, some of some of the investments in seed, specific, specifically maize, yes, that has certainly happened. Um, so out of the 40 billion uh, global investment in agricultural research, 8 billion is private sector. So it's not everything out there, but it's 8 billion. 4 billion of that is into food processing. So again, less interesting. 4 billion is into the seed sector. 4 billion out of 40, so 10%, but a very effective 10% uh, at least in the maize, um, for maize seed production. Why has this concentration happened? So it's not something that you know, we necessarily want to seize um, in markets. It has happened because of this huge regulatory um, environment that has developed specifically around uh, GMOs, but also around other te technology approval. So the entrance cost for new companies uh, to become seed developers has, has become so prohibitive that no one else wants to enter the market. So what we really need is a review of the regulatory systems to allow other companies actually to you know, to, to develop seeds as well. And there's a lot, there's, I guess, similar to climate change and innovation technologies because of the food price crisis and also because countries, you know, are increasingly looking into other ways and new ways to produce more food. So there are now many more new companies that operate again, maybe more under the radar. There's a lot more, so a lot of the investment in the public sector, that the increase has, as I, as I said, taken place in Brazil, India, China, and these countries actually have started to generate, you know, to develop some, also some new private sector uh, enterprises because obviously there's a very big agricultural markets, um, also still a lot of farmers in those countries. So there are some new developments. It's certainly not what we'd like to see. I mean, we'd like to see many more um, private uh, companies, especially you know, outside the OECD, uh, go into more seed sector development, but it remains in, in those countries, we don't have enough regulatory capacity, so it remains a struggle over uh, reg regulation in, in OECD and under regulation in, in developing countries. So we, we are trying to help some of those other countries to, to strengthen their regulatory capacity. And in the developed countries, we hope that uh, there's a review, you know, an, an opening entry point so that other uh, companies can enter that, that the seed market. Well, we have come to the end of our panel. I do not know whether we have begun to turn the tanker, but I think that you will agree with me that our fantastic panelists have identified for us some incredibly important issues that we need to collectively take into account on the way forward, and they have very importantly pointed us to paths of solution. So uh, please join me in thanking Claudia, Fiona, and Stuart for having so wonderfully shared their expertise with us today. Thank you. I join my voice to yours. Uh, so everybody, um, the next we have a little break and then we're going out to some breakout sessions. So people who are interested in hearing more from Claudia about food security, she'll be joined by Paul Ace from the Food Institute right here. Uh, they will be speaking uh, right here in fact, is that correct? No. Upstairs. Somewhere up Okay, 18th floor. So down the hall here and taking the uh, elevator up to the 18th. Uh, Fiona is going to stay right here. She's going to be talking to Stephen Guibault of Equitaire, um, who used to be with Greenpeace on Canada's energy landscape. And finally, Stuart is going to the University Ballroom, which is where everybody had lunch, up there and on the second floor, uh, to talk with Peter Victor and Françoise Bertrand about a sustainable economy. Um, you'll find coffee in all the rooms. And before I leave you, I have to say that I was very, very struck by 
all the talks about feed-in tariffs. You know, the Trudeau Foundation is very, very much affected by feed-in tariffs. We're very good at feed-in, and we're really not all that good at tariffs. Um, all our speakers are volunteering their time, but the costs associated with a conference like this are significant. So if any of you would like to make this conference more renewable, please do see my colleagues on your way out. Thank you. <laughs>